Hello, uh, a lot of you here. Thanks a lot for coming to to my talk. Um, it will be a fun one, I hope so, and I hope that you will learn uh, something new. So, uh, before we officially start, let me say something about me. So, let me introduce you. Uh, I'm Ivan, I work as a senior software engineer. I am mainly working with JavaScript. I have my own consulting agency, uh, and I also do some consultancy for uh, Nearform. So uh, I'm building JS remotely, so if you're looking for a, a remote, new remote JavaScript job, uh, you can check it out. There's a lot of cool things there. And yeah, I, as I said, I'm working remotely from my home, so consulting for uh, the whole world, basically. Uh, I'm writing on my blog, and you can find me on, uh, on Twitter, too. So um, let's start, yeah. Uh, recently, I was talking with, uh, with my friend, um, and I, I posted here how the, 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 that uh, chat was going on. So uh, I have a friend, let's name him Bob, and just sent him uh, a message like a month ago, uh, how's life, uh, what's new? And Bob answered, yeah, so all good. Um, and he started mentioning that there's uh, uh, some new cool project that his team I is working on. So I was excited to, to hear more about it. So just asked him uh, what the project uh, about. And then Bob started. So the project is great. They're using some awesome new technology. They're using React, uh, MobX, uh, GraphQL, and everything packed in the AWS Lambda. So I thought, wow, this is something big. You know, that they're, they're building some, some crazy stuff in the company. So that's, that's what I wrote. So this really sounds interesting. And uh, what's the whole project about? Uh, I'm thinking about like they're building like some system for the bank or, or some something like that. And then Bob wrote this, so yeah, we're building a blog for the real estate company. So I was like really impressed to see this. So like a blog for, for the, the, the real estate company, that's like a mind blow. Uh, why are you using so, so many uh, complicated technologies to build just a simple blog? So that really made like a, a big explosion in my mind. Uh, so what's really wrong here? What's what's wrong in, the, in this discussion and what's wrong with the things that uh, Bob is doing? Uh, they're building something fairly simple and because they want to use something modern because there is a whole hype around some new technologies, they're putting everything without really without a specific need uh, to use that, they could, I mean, it's a blog, you can just use WordPress or, or Ghost or something simple, and then just move with that, you don't need MobX or even GraphQL. You can use, but yeah, it's like really, um, really, really big like frameworks and, and um, applications that you will uh, put in a blog. So uh, before we like um, continue uh, with this, uh, we will need to like move to the to the like back to the future, so back to the past, and see uh, like this old uh, website. Uh, do you remember like when websites looked like this? This is eBay like 20 years ago, and uh, just want to compare uh, the sites that existed like 20, 30 years ago when the web was created, and the one that uh, we use nowadays. Uh, so, what do we see on the, on the on this uh, web uh, website. So we see some text, as you saw, um, a lot of them. Uh, we see some pictures. Uh, again, we see links, uh, then some input fields, uh, buttons for search. So that's really like the, the same thing that we have nowadays. So what is exactly? Okay, so what is different comparing to the to the modern web applications that uh, that we are building again? All all modern new applications have the same components that uh, we used like 20 years ago. Uh, so the only different thing is state. So uh, applications became uh, really complicated, and they're working with a uh, really big amount of data that's like jumping around every second. Uh, we are working. So client is sending data to the back end, back end is sending data uh, back to the front end. Uh, people are cl clicking around, uh, you know, there are web sockets. A lot of things are happening there. And nowadays we, we need some good technologies to handle that state. That's why like the, the 
the whole idea um, uh, that's the whole idea around this talk to show you um, how to uh, handle the state in a in a proper way. So I said we have state people talking about state, but what exactly is the state? So according to dictionary.com, state is like the uh, part, uh, particular condition that something is in at a specific time. So if we have our application uh, at a specific time, how our application looks and what data it has, that's exactly uh, the state of that app. And there are different uh, types of the of states. So we're usually talking about this application state, also called uh, program state. And that's uh, everything that's uh, needed to, to make your uh, application uh, application running uh, at one point in time. Uh, also, beside the application state, we, ho we have the, this uh, resource state. So uh, that's the state of resources uh, that's on the server. So all the images, the uh, database records, and everything like that that's living on the server, it's called like resource state. And of course, there is uh, a session state. So it keeps the track of your user. So who's logged in and what data your user has uh, in one browser uh, browser session. So um, I said we will go uh, in the past. We saw the, the eBay website like 20 years ago. Um, so, what really, uh, what was the like the main thing that that changed how we um, build the um, the applications now? So I think it's like should be this event. So the TechCrunch disrupt uh, in San Francisco in September uh, 2012. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, so the CEO of, of Facebook, was one of the panelists, um, and he said that their biggest mistake was uh, betting too much on HTML5. So back then, fa Facebook uh, was experimenting with, probably remember, there was some uh, framework on top of PHP that, that they wanted to use to help them like uh, manage um, manage their state and their, uh, their applications. Um, and they, they tried a lot of things. They even tried to build something on the, uh, with uh, JavaScript, and that didn't work. Um, so they stopped a bit, but then in uh, September 2012, uh, he said that uh, they're having big problems with the uh, Facebook ads, so they want like something dynamic that will be changing uh, in in a user session without uh, like crashing your computer and browser. And they thought that HTML5 will solve that, uh, but no. So they started working on React, and next like main event um, for React like is when when it was open source. So it's May 2000. Um, 13, uh, so it was it was introduced on the JSConf US. Uh, before React, we had like some frameworks like Angular started I think to, to, uh, 2010. Uh, there was Backbone, Ember, JS, and they existed um, in the past. People used them, but Facebook, Facebook wanted something new, some like a small library that will allow you to build uh, your uh, interfaces, and that's. When I think that so also that's when we we got uh, components in the front end and that's when the the whole revolution started in the front end people were starting to split up back end front end to start using webpack and and that's how it started so not exactly like like this with the Trump it was more like this uh, this is how revolutions happen in the in the programming world uh, so 2014 we had uh, the first uh, React Conf is this. Yeah, it works. Okay, because I'm not here <laughs> myself behind. Okay, so uh, 2014 we had um, the first React Conf where they like uh, officially said what what React is. They they gave uh, some some examples, and uh, React had uh, people immediately saw that React is just a simple library for handling UI changes. It didn't have like um, data flow. Um, they didn't ha didn't had um, uh, data flow in mind when they started building React. Uh, so uh, after the React first React Conf. There are some companies that started using React, and that's why it became so popular. So Facebook first. Nowadays, Facebook is using React all over the place. They're using a lot of tools. They're even building tools. They're still maintaining React. Then the next thi next one is Netflix. So again, the really big company. They started to refactor all their UIs in in React, and also Airbnb. They started small, but they they wrote a lot um, uh, about React, and they created even some some cool modules that we still use. Uh, and that gained um, React a uh, really big popularity. So why did did this? Uh, they wanted to, to create like better user interfaces, uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic interactive uh, user uh, user interfaces. 
So, um, for as I said, React was uh, open sourced uh, 2013, and uh, people immediately saw that data flow is really problematic there. So they started uh, creating um, libraries uh, to help us to to, um, to work with data and to maintain the uh, React app uh, state. So um, history of the React state, um, what we had through the history, what we use for maintaining uh, the state of React. First thing is component state. So, you know, set state, it's it's coming with React and it was there from the beginning. But then also Facebook announced uh, Flux. So one type of architecture that they started using and they're still using it on, on many places. But then like uh, Flux was uh, really complicated. So some guys created uh, Redux to, to make it like, um, much simpler for uh, for developers. Then nowadays we have like GraphQL where we keep like state on the, in the back end and also co copy that state in the front end and have Relay to help us uh, sync that state between the front end back end application. Uh, we have MobX. So MobX is uh, like um, representing a state in a reactive way uh, through streams. And recently uh, we got React 16. So there is like context API and, and React hooks. So context API is uh, again helping us to, to maintain states uh, of our apps. And React hooks just enables us to try to tweet your code uh, and, and handle our state. So let's go one by one and see um, what are the pros and cons and, and how those uh, all those modules and all those ways uh, for handling the React state work. So uh, first one is component state. Um, as I said, it's just uh, setting the state inside the component. So this is a simple component that's, uh, that has a date, uh, the current date in the state, and it's just printing that in the lo um, local time string. So nothing special. This is how the one component can handle its own state. If you're using React, uh, you probably saw this many times. And then, I uh, hope you can see this. Uh, then we can use the set state. So we create some interval here and then update the the state every second. Uh, so this is how we can uh, update the state. And then uh, React was created so to, to react on all those uh, changes really, really fast. So it will just re-render immediately and uh, we will see the, the changes instantly on the screen. So what are the, the pros if you if you want to, if you're building a new app and you're starting with, uh, uh, with uh, handling uh, the state using component state, uh, what are the pros there? First thing is comes with React, so you don't need to do anything. It's immediately there. You don't need to install uh, anything. Um, every component has that uh, out of the box. Uh, it's really easy to use, uh, easy to learn. Um, but what are the what are the uh, what are the cons of the of the component state? Uh, first thing is uh, it's hard to change state between components. So if you have uh, a lot of components, every component will have its own state, and then um, like sending the that those props uh, around the application and around the the React component three uh, three will be uh, really hard. Also, if you have one component that's sending some some uh, data to the other one, and that the other one wants to update uh, the the state of the parent component. Sometimes that can be hard. Uh, you will need to pass all those functions all over the the React tree, uh, and it's really complicated uh, to maintain uh, maintain all those uh, data exchange between the components when your application becomes uh, becomes really big. So component state is good for for handling the state. Uh, in the smaller apps, or if you have some small interactivity between components, or your own component just has to uh, has its own state and it wants to, to react um, and change when the user clicks on it or something like that, that's the perfect use case. But when it becomes big, uh, it's really hard to maintain that. So um, next one is Flux. So it was created as the architecture pattern for for React uh, data data flow. And uh, it was created by Facebook, uh, and Flux looks like this. So, like this is the official um, official image uh, chart or yeah diagram for from the from uh, Flux website. So, how it works? Um, first thing, let's come. Let's start from the here. So, React views. We we have that when the user comes to a page, he immediately sees the React views, and then we have some 
user interaction. So user does something, clicks somewhere, enters some data, submits the form, whatever. And then we have the action creator. So those action creators can connect to the, to the uh, web API, can save some data there, or even pull some data, whatever is, is required. And then when we receive the response through the action, we are contacting dispatcher. So dispatcher is just um, is a class that uh, has an event listener for uh, for uh, every action, and just uh, having a callback function that will be executed for the specific action, and then we put that inside the store. When the store is updated, uh, we have so uh, store is changed. Uh, we have some change events, and our React view is uh, uh, updated again. So this is like uh, something that. Um, Facebook uh, wanted to have, and they, they created this. Uh, it's kind of simple. Uh, it gives you like a way to have your store outside of the component and then import that store uh, through all the components. Then you have separate actions. Uh, you have those dispatchers that's uh, uh, that are updating the store, and then whenever the store updates, uh, if the component is listening for some changes, it will uh, update uh, when, those, uh, when that data changes. Uh, so what are the pros of, of Flux. Here we have much simpler um, data flow, so uh, it's in uh, going in one direction. So as you saw, um, data just flows uh, around, so from store to, to the um, React view and back to the store and so on. So it's just going into uh, one direction and it's helping us to easily uh, handle the data uh, across the, the components. Uh, and yeah, components listen to the store and react on changes. So you just need to connect your your component with the with the store, uh, listen for the specific uh, uh, data changes, and that's all. You can you can write your component and then just uh, expect it to to refresh to update whenever something changes there. But there are some also cons uh, with Flux. Uh, first thing is that it has a mutable state. Uh, then it ha have multiple stores, so it's not like one store. There can be multiple stores. Uh, you don't have like very best practice there. You can do whatever. You can have multiple stores, and then uh, sometimes your component might need to connect to a couple different stores. Uh, that means that there are multiple sources of truth. So um, when you have like multiple stores, you will probably need to stay to store some data uh, across those stores, and then you have uh, duplications. Um, so that can create a, a problems when your application scales. And there's a boilerplate, so you will need to, to, to write dispatcher actions, um, stores a lot of code there uh, for every type of the data, so uh, there can be a lot of code and a lot of files uh, to work with. Uh, then it was about Flux, then Redux uh, came out like to do fix this problem. So uh, Dan Abramov, he's now working for uh, for React. He created Redux with the, the uh, Flux architecture uh, in mind, but he wanted to create something really, uh, really simple. And that simple thing looks like this. So you remember the how the how Flux looked like. Uh, this is how Redux uh, looks like. So we have again the the React view, and then we send uh, some action. And then the next actions is going to the reducer, and then reducer updates the store. Uh, data is coming uh, back to the React view, and that's all. So uh, different big difference here is that uh, reducer is just a simple function. Um, action is just a, um, a simple so it's simple object uh, with the type of the action and the data payload that we want to to, uh, to store, and. Uh, the store is just uh, one big uh, object of data, so the, the view can uh, connect to this store and um, listen to the data and react on them. Uh, on a previous, uh, like with the Flux, we also had an example of how we work with the API. So in Redux, we need to uh, put some middleware, so some uh, library on top of the Redux to help us handle those side effects. because. Uh, um, uh, uh, Redux uh, doesn't work with uh, async stuff natively, so we need uh, to have middlewares to help with the APIs or with the WebSocket or whatever is like async uh, around the app. So when we put middleware uh, for every action, we so for action we have a middleware that listens for the action, uh, sends a request to the API, waits for the uh, for the result, and then sending that result again to the reducer. Uh, 
so the Redux pros um, has like same as as Flux. So simple data flow. It's going to one direction. Uh, you can easily handle again uh, data across the components. Then the components are uh, listening. So, so through the um, React Redux library, you can connect your component to the to the store, listen to the changes, and there's one more important thing. So in Redux, there's always uh, one store per app. So and that's also immutable store. So uh, you have just one store where the, where the data is living. So it's much easier uh, to store everything there and to have your components connect to just one place and have just one source of, of truth. And there's no complicated dispatcher. So uh, Redux already knows uh, how to handle uh, actions. You don't need to tell tell him how to do that. You just need to tell uh, what data to put where and how to um, how to uh, modify the data if that's needed uh, and store that uh, into the store. Uh, that sounds great, but what are the what are the uh, cons of the Redux? So it's not that perfect. Uh, again, we have a, a lot of boilerplate. If you ever worked with Redux, you know that uh, reducers, actions, constants, uh, and everything is is like uh, bouncing around your app. So you have like uh, one file for your component, and you have three, four, five uh, files plus uh, for handling that state. So uh, there will be a lot of code, and also for like updating one um, for like uh, having the the listener for button on click if you want to send some data to the API, you will again need to to write something uh, in the middle where you need to write an action. So it's not not like uh, that easy. You need to write a lot of code to accomplish some simple simple things, and there's always a middleware. So. Uh, as I said, Redux uh, can only help you with uh, data inside your app. If you want some um, async stuff, so, so some third-party things that's around your app, you will need to, to insert some middleware. So again, that's more boilerplate code, so more modules to install, more things to configure, uh, more documentation to read. Some people really, uh, this is like the, some people say that this is like the main con of the, of the Redux. Um, it always needs uh, something else on the site. Uh, so after like Redux, so a couple of years ago, uh, we got GraphQL. So GraphQL, if you don't know what it is, it's just the query language for uh, for the for the web API. So simply like this, uh, with the REST protocol, we have um, a uh, endpoint for for uh, every entity. Then we have post, get, put methods, delete, and so on. Uh, with GraphQL, we have just one endpoint, um, and we just send a uh, string like this. So we have query, we can select the event we want, the data we want to be returned, same thing for like location, uh, we can filter by place, we can um, return uh, the data, also uh, uh, nested data, and then we just uh, receive one big uh, JSON. So uh, why am I talking like about uh, React and this is the talk about uh, of, uh, sorry about uh, GraphQL and this is talk about React state and uh, the front end because the uh, GraphQL became popular just because of the of the React and um, like it's trying to help us handle easily handle uh, the the React state. Uh, so uh, GraphQL comes with a lot of tools, so it's really easy to set up something on the back end, connect your database, uh, and then just use those queries so you can work even with, without the, the back-end developer and just use those queries to uh, mutate data and to, to query uh, data. And with, uh, if you want to connect your, um, your um, fr uh, front-end React application with the GraphQL, you need to use Relay. So this is again coming from, from Facebook. Uh, there are also some other uh, modules uh, that you can use like Apollo, but uh, s um, Relay should be like the, the the easiest to start with uh, with working and easiest to uh, to set up um, your React app to work with the GraphQL. Uh, so how is Relay working? Uh, simple. We have the uh, server, so that's where the the GraphQL uh, is. So the, where the server is living, that that knows how to parse the GraphQL uh, queries. Uh, then we have the Relay store, so it's living on the the front end. You can easily create the Relay store. We have the components, so some React components, and we have actions. We start from the components, so user comes to the page, clicks something, does something. Uh, 
you create an action. Uh, and that action is sent to the server. And also we have the immediate optimistic update saved in the sorry, in the in the relay store. And that relay store will immediately update your, your component. So if you like um, uh, that's because the server is uh, having the same data as the relay store. So if you have like a list of, of I don't know, imagine this is like a Twitter and you have uh, a list of tweets, um, want to, to post a new one or edit one or delete one, whatever, uh, Relay immediately knows that it has to update um, uh, the Relay store. So if this is just happening on the front end, it just edits that uh, entity or uh, removes it and your component is immediately updated. And then the GraphQL uh, write, so the GraphQL uh, query is going to the server, updates that, and then uh, there is like a sync between uh, Relay and the server happening um, to have, uh, to have the, the consistent data in both places. Uh, so this is really fast, it's really easy. Um, uh, server, uh, so uh, really gives us the ability to, to uh, have like fragments, so just to uh, say in the components what data we want uh, from the GraphQL, so what query we want, and then really we pack everything together and send that one request to the server, uh, put the data here, and then you can modify data in the relay and in the server at the same time. Uh, so it's really uh, a nice uh, developer experience and it will help you to create a really nice uh, user experience because everything will be uh, fast uh, on the page. Uh, how this works in the component. So this here story is like one, uh, one component. Uh, we have some data here and we have this higher order component uh, relay that just wraps the story around and gives the the some abilities to store, like to, to query data, to send mutations. In GraphQL, mutations are like um, requests to update some data uh, on the server, and queries are requests to, to, to uh, return some data. Uh, so we, we can have um, a request, so uh, we can send a re uh, read request to the relay store, we receive the results, then the relay high order component will just send everything as a prop uh, to your um, child component and it will be re-rendered. And also the relay higher order component will always listen for the changes in the relay store. So if some other component updates something in the in the relay store, uh, it will be um, immediately sent to, to this component too. Uh, so this really sounds uh, nice and easy. Uh, the pros here are like that this is like made for driven uh, data-driven applications. So Facebook tried to, to fix the, the problem with React, and that's why they created a Relay uh, to help us like have uh, some simple data flow uh, for React that's easy to, to implement and also much e much e really easy to use without uh, many boilerplates. Um, so simple data flow, um, as you see, everything is like working magically. Uh, you just uh, send an action, it's immediately updated in the store and also in the back end. And you have the scripting components. So you can just write, my components needs this and that, um, put this in one div, put this in input uh, input field, and that's all. Just connect that to the relay store and it magically works. Um, and this is the only, like from the ones that I will show today, this is the only one that, um, um, the only module that solves that cli uh, client server uh, data flow out of the box without you uh, requiring you to write any piece of code um, to fix that. Uh, it's not that perfect. We always have uh, some cons. So uh, learning documentation is big. You need to, to learn and understand really for like, um, uh, you can start with uh, with uh, using Relay, but I think that it's always important to understand what's really happening in the background. So you need to spend some time to, to learn those things. And also uh, it's like magical. So same thing that people say for Ang Angular, everything is happening magically. Here is, is uh, is the same thing. You're just sending some actions, um, putting stuff in your component, and everything just works. So um, sometimes you, you need to understand what's really happening uh, in the background. And yeah, after Relay, there's mobx for, for handling uh, the React state. Uh, 
uh, MobX is using reactive programming. So if you don't know what reactive programming is, it's just working with observables. Observables just stream of data. So you have like continuous uh, stream, and you can connect something to to uh, to listen for that stream. So that's observer, observer, so some function or something like that. And then whenever some data comes inside that um, that stream, uh, the observer will be uh, called. Same thing that like also a good uh, use case for, for front-end development for React, because we can have those components being uh, ob observers, and then observable uh, will be like a store uh, of data, and then uh, React will, um, so React component will listen for data changes and then uh, react on, on those changes. So if we have some UI components here, we have some actions coming from the MobX, so to fetch something, update something, those actions are, are simple functions. And then we can have uh, observables and computed valu values. Those values are, are living uh, in the uh, in the store. So observables are just like arrays of data or objects or uh, whatever uh, type of data you want to have. And computed are like um, functions that um, before the data is coming uh, to the UI component, you can use computed to uh, update data and to format it however you want to. Um, to show uh, that in the in the UI uh, component, and computed um, uh, functions are listening for the observables, and whenever something changes here, computer value um, processes that and sends that to to your uh, UI component. Um, so the pros of MobX are reactive programming, so everything is a stream. A lot of people like reactive programming, so it's same as uh, functional programming. You have um, few pure functions there, you just process the data uh, that's uh, coming in stream, uh, you returning back, so it's really simple to, to, to work with data. Uh, store can do anything, so you can write those uh, observables, you can write uh, computed functions, you can write actions, and you have the whole freedom to do whatever you want inside your store. You can have just one store, you have multiple stores, uh, MobX uh, allows you to have uh, everything. Uh, there's not much boilerplate code because your store will contain all the actions, all the functions, everything. So it's not like in Redux where uh, it's like recommended to split up everything across the, the files because there will be a lot of code. Uh, inside MobX, you immediately have everything inside one big, uh, so inside one class, you can put, you have like complicated application with 200 lines of the MobX code and handle everything. Uh, and there are no middlewares, so uh, since those actions can also be async, you can have um, any async code in your actions, uh, sending HTTP requests, and then waiting for those uh, uh, actions, so for those uh, API requests to resolve um, and update the store. Uh, what are the cons? So cons are like, there's no like specific standard. As I said, in, in Redux, they, they recommend a bunch of things uh, for MobX, you can do whatever you want. So uh, there's sometimes too much freedom. People try to decouple everything and then do the same thing uh, like we, we have with Redux. Uh, then reactive programming is hard, and, and people really say that it's uh, you will need to spend some time to to learn how uh, reactive programming works, uh, so you can become expert with one mob accent and uh, see what are the the, the um, what are the things that you can you can do with it. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to debug, as I said, everything is a stream there, so data is like circling around. If you don't set up things properly, uh, you will spend a lot of time to dig down to see uh, wh wh what data is missing or why your component doesn't update uh, properly. So um, it can become hard if, it's, uh, if it becomes really big and without a specific standard. So those are uh, those were the the like external modules, so third-party modules that that we can use for um, handling the state. But uh, then, I think it was it was not a year ago, but it was a couple of months, some months ago. Uh, React 16 came uh, and they released a bunch of uh, new cool things uh, that we can use uh, for s other stuff, but also for handling the the React state. The first one is like context API. When it came, people started to, to write that Redux is done. Uh, we, we now just need context API because it's much easier to use. It's not third, third party thing. There is not a lot of a boilerplate. And they're kind of right, but um, it can become uh, complicated. The, the context is living inside. So inside React module, uh, it's uh, 
uh, always there, and you just need to create contexts. Uh, so you can create like uh, theme context, the user context, and then you have those uh, from user content and theme context. You receive provider and uh, consumer. So the provider is is taking that data, and it's like higher order component. So it's a parent component. Uh, uh, and uh, that so every data that's coming from the provider will be always available in any component uh, down the tree. So it's much easier than using um, in the like pre first example where we had set state. You had to pass everything as a prop. So here with the context context API, everything will be uh, available in any component. And this is how like the the parent uh, works. If you ha want to have uh, some content, so uh, some child component you can use uh, consumer so theme content consumer user content consumer and then you can uh, listen to the data and read the data from the provider so you can imp you can use this in any in any child component and it's much easier than passing everything so you can have like hundreds uh, hundred uh, components above and then still use consumer here and have the data that's coming from some parent um, parent above uh, so, uh, in the same way, uh, we can create a, in our uh, root uh, component, we can create some state and then pass everything down. We can also pass the function functions and um, any component can use those functions to update the state and then uh, other components that listen to, to that state will uh, update. And also we got uh, React hooks, so there was a big hype about this. So just Basically, like using the, the the same React state, but just in a bit different way. So we got use state here. Um, you need um, like one line of code to to work with the state. Uh, immediately from the use state, you get the value, you get the method to update that that state, and then you can use that uh, in your component and easily uh, work with the state. But again, it's just helping you to hand to easily handle uh, the. Uh, single component state. If you want to exchange data across, you will again need to use uh, something else like Redux Mobex or to use Context API uh, to send the data um, across uh, other components. Uh, so we came to the end. Uh, some conclusion uh, from this, the, this talk. If you're starting uh, with some new project, uh, you need to pick wisely what you want to use. So based on, on the, the project size, so don't be like my friend Bob, he, he started a project to build something fairly simple and he used all those complicated technologies that, um, you know, will just make problems in the future. Uh, and also previous knowledge, so he used MobX and I'm sure that he doesn't know reactive programming, so like making one blog can take a lot of months if you don't pick wisely. Uh, also, uh, popular doesn't always mean the best. There are some really popular tools uh, there, but it doesn't mean that you will um, you would like to work with them and that they're like the best use case uh, for your application. Uh, also, learn the basics. Uh, there are a lot of junior developers that don't even know how the set state works. Uh, they don't know that it's like async, but they are experts in Redux. So start from the basics, uh, learn what's there in React, see if you can work with that, and then if you need something more, install some some other library uh, also combine uh, there I saw use cases where people use like GraphQL and relay with mobx because they want to have some reactive way they're building some uh, um, like a uh, broker system where they, they had um, a lot of chart uh, real-time ones so uh, mobx is giving the ability uh, to have fast real-time applications and then they have the GraphQL uh, backend with the relay so they're combining all three things uh, and creating really, uh, really good user experience. Uh, and at the end, yeah, so every new package for handling the state is like coming uh, out and then say that they will fix the previous one, they will fix everything. Uh, but yeah, can we have a, a perfect pa uh, package for, for every use case? That's like the, the question for the end. Uh, thank you. <laughs>